In this lesson, we want to talk about refrigerants. After completing this lesson, you should be able to discuss applications for high, medium, and low temperature refrigerants. You should describe the, the term ton of refrigeration. You should once again be able to describe, describe the basic refrigeration cycle, and you should be able to see this on the enthalpy chart. You should be able to explain the relationship between pressure and boiling point of water or any other liquids, and you should be able to describe the function of an evaporator or cooling coil. You should be able to explain the purpose of the compressor, and you should be able to list the compressors normally used in residential or light commercial buildings and discuss the function of the condensing coil. You should be able to state the purpose of the metering device and list the four characteristics to consider when choosing a refrigerant for a system. We should be able to identify the colors of the refrigeration cylinders for various types of refrigerants, and you should be able to describe how refrigerants could be stored, processed, while the refrigeration systems are being serviced. You should be able to plot a refrigeration cycle for refrigerants on a pressure enthalpy diagram, and you should be able to plot a refrigeration cycle on a pressure enthalpy diagram for refrigerant blends as well. So, where did it all start? Cooling was used to preserve products and provide comfort back in the 1900s, and it was the beginning of the mechanical refrigeration systems. Refrigeration processes are on different temperature ranges, high temperatures for air conditioning, medium temperatures for fresh food and preservation, and low temperatures for frozen food. Refrigeration is the process of transferring heat from one place where it's objectionable to a place where it makes little or no difference. Heat naturally flows from a warmer substance to a cooler substance. Heat will flow naturally from a 100 degree house if the outside temperature is 80. Mechanical refrigeration is needed if the house is 80 and the outside temperature is 100 because it would flow backwards. So again, heat flows from a warmer to a cooler. Heat will flow outside in if the inside temperature is cooler. Mechanical refrigeration would be needed in this case. So, it takes 144 BTUs to melt one pound of ice at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. 2,000 pounds of ice, which is one ton, will require 288,000 BTUs to melt. That's 144 times 2,000. So, if melting one ton of ice takes place in one day over 24 hours, 12,000 must be absorbed by the ice every hour. So, 288,000 divided by 24 is 12,000. So 12,000 BTUs per hour equals 200 BTUs per minute, which equals one ton of refrigeration. Heat is pumped from the cool box to a warm room. It's similar to pumping water uphill. Air conditioners pump heat from inside to the outside. We're not making the building cold, we're removing heat. So if the inside temperature is 75 degrees and the outside temperature is 95 degrees, the cooling or indoor coil temperature should be 40 degrees. The condenser is 125 degrees. Notice 30 degrees below indoor temperature and 30 degrees above outdoor temperature. Indoor heat travels into the indoor coil and the system heat flows from the outdoor coil to the outside air. So I have a cooling coil at 40 degrees, inside temperature 75. Heat naturally flows from the air inside the house into the cooling coil. That's the evaporator. Then the refrigerant moves through the system and allows heat to naturally flow from the condenser coil to the ambient air surrounding the coil. Water boils at 212 degrees. Water boils at atmospheric pressures. If I increase the pressure to 15 psi, it boils at 250 degrees. Water boils at 40 degrees if pressure is reduced to 0.248 inches mercury. Refrigerants are substances that boil at low pressures and temperatures and condense at high pressures and temperatures. Saturation temperature is the point at which the additional or removal of heat will result in a change of state. During a change of state, the temperature remains constant. We have four components. The evaporator absorbs heat from the area to be cooled. The compressor creates pressure dif difference needed to facilitate refrigerant flow through the system. The condenser rejects the system heat, and the metering device regulates refrigerant flow to the evaporator. The evaporator has a he heat exchange surface that's used to absorb heat. It's located on the low pressure side of the system between the metering device and the compressor. It operates at temperatures lower than the medium being cooled or conditioned. It absorbs heat by boiling a low temperature liquid into a low temperature vapor. 
The evaporator has refrigerant entering it as a liquid vapor, vapor mix, 75% liquid, 25% vapor. Superheat is the heating of vapor above its saturation temperature. It ensures that no liquid refrigerant enters the compressor and it's equal to the evaporator outlet temperature minus the evaporator saturation temperature. Design superheat is typically between 8 and 12 degrees Fahrenheit. Superheated vapor does not follow a pressure temperature relationship. So this is the evaporator. Liquid vapor comes in from the metering device about 68.5 degrees which is 40 degrees and it stays 40 degrees all the way through because superheated vapor does not follow the temperature pressure relationship. Might have the last drop of liquid around the last in the last coil and then the pressure will start or the temperature will start increasing but the pressure won't change. Superheated vapor continues on to the compressor. The compressor provides the heat laden vapor from the evaporator to the condenser by increasing the refrigerant pressure. It reduces the pressure on the low side of the system. It increases the pressure on the high side of the system. Common compressor types include the scroll, reciprocating, and rotary compressor. It's a positive displacement compressor that requires that the compressed gas be moved to the condenser. Refrigerant enters from the evaporator through the suction line, gets compressed, leaves the discharge line, and goes on to the condenser. The condenser rejects the sensible and latent heat from the system that was absorbed by the compressor and evaporator. It's located on the high side of the system. The refrigerant condenses from a high pressure or high temperature vapor to a high temperature liquid. Condensing temperature is determined by the high pressure in the system. Refrigerant that is subcooled is at the outlet of the condenser. Subcooling is the cooling of liquid refrigerant below its saturation temperature. Standard air-cooled systems are designed to operate with a minimum of 10 degrees subcooling. High efficiency systems operate with more subcooling than standard efficiency systems. Determined by subtracting the condenser saturation temperature from the condenser outlet temperature on the liquid line. So we have our condenser here. Superheated vapor from the compressor comes in, loses its sensible heat, then starts turning into a liquid. The temperature and pressure will remain constant all the way through the change of state. At the end, the temperature will start to rise, but the pressure will remain constant. The pressure temperature range does not hold in the, so, um, in the sensible heat changes. The metering device controls the flow of the subcooled liquid from the condenser to the evaporator. It creates a pressure drop between the high and low sides of the system. About 25% of the liquid leaving the metering device immediately vaporizes, thus the term flash gas. There are three commonly used metering devices, the capillary tube, the automatic expansion valve, and the thermostatic expansion valve. Putting it all together, you have your compressor, condenser, metering device, evaporator. Liquid flows through the system, saturated refrigerant in the evaporator, 100% vapor going into the compressor, coming out of the compressor, high temperature, high pressure vapor, moves into the condenser, begins condensing, leaves the condenser through the liquid line as a subcooled liquid, and starts all over again. Superheat in this example is 50 degrees. 40 degree minus 10 or 40 and 10. Subcooling is 125 minus 110 for 15 degree subcooling. The types of refrigerants, R12 was primarily used for high and medium temperature refrigeration. It's banned in 1996. Now we now use R22 for the same application, but it's going away in 2030. R500 and 502, again, it banned in 1996, replaced with 134A. Replacements for R22 include 410A and 407C. Refrigerants must be safe. They must be designed to protect people from sickness, injury, and death. Proper ventilation is required. Refrigerants can displace oxygen if permitted to accumulate and can suffocate you. Modern refrigerants are non-toxic. That does not mean they can't suffocate you because they still will. When burned, toxic or corrosive gases are created. 
They must be detectable. They must either bubble with soap bubbles. They must um, appear in a halide leak detector. They can appear in an electronic leak detector and ultraviolet and ultrasonic. Refrigerants should boil at a low temperature at atmospheric pressure, so low temperatures can be obtained without going into a vacuum. It is illegal to intentionally vent refrigerants to the atmosphere. Mandatory certifications through the EPA is a must, and the EPA set refrigeration phase-out schedules. Refrigeration cylinders and drums are color-coded. Refrigerant recovery is mandatory during system installation and service, and it's intended to reduce the emissions of these refrigerants into the atmosphere. Recovery equipment must be used in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. All refrigerants can be plotted on a, on a pressure enthalpy chart. It can create a graphical representation of a refrigerant system. Pressure scales are on the vertical axis in PSIA. Enthalpy scale is along the bottom of the chart, and the horseshoe curve represents the saturation curve. Refrigerant is saturated on or under the curve. Enthalpy is heat content of a substance. So this is an example of a pressure enthalpy chart. Pressure is up the left side, enthalpy is across the bottom. You have a saturation curve, and outside the saturation curve is subcooled liquid or superheated vapor. You can actually plot the full basis of the refrigeration system by using connecting dots on the chart. So the compressor is increasing pressure. The condenser is decreasing temperature. The metering device is dropping pressure and the evaporator is raising temperature. So this is an example of an R22 system. My condenser saturation temperature is at 130 degrees F Fahrenheit or 311.5 PSI A. Make sure you add your 14.7. The evaporation saturation temperature is 40 degrees, which is 68.5 PSI G or 83.2 PSI A. Again, add your 14.7 PSI. Zero degrees of subcooling, so the refrigerant enters the metering device at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Evaporator sub superheat is 10 degrees, so refrigerant leaves the evaporator at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Suction line superheat is 10 degrees Fahrenheit, so the refrigerant enters the compressor at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Refrigerant leaves the compressor at 190 degrees. And that's the plot of a refrigeration cycle for an R22. Your refrigeration cycle is now in the yellow box. Metering device is A to B. Evaporator is B to C. Suction line is C to D. Compressor is D to E. Condenser is E to A. The net refrigeration effect in this case is 110 because you subtract B and C, which is 110 minus 40, and that's 70 BTUs per pound of refrigerant. Heat of compression is E minus C, so 127 minus 110 is 17. Total heat rejection, E minus A, 127 minus 40 is 87. Heat of work is E minus D, 127 minus 122 is 15 BTU. Common refrigeration temperature ranges are high, medium, and low. High temperature refrigeration is also referred to as air conditioning or comfort cooling. Refrigeration is the process of transferring heat from one place where it is objectional to a place where it makes little or no difference. Heat flows naturally from warm to cool substances. Saturated refrigerants follow a pressure temperature relationship. One ton of it Refrigeration is equal to 12,000 BTUs, and the evaporator is, absorbs the heat, condenser rejects heat, and metering device regulates the refrigerant flow to the evaporator. The compressor creates the pressure difference in the system that allows the refrigerant to flow. We have superheat 
which is the outlet temperature minus the evaporation saturation temperature, subcooling, condenser sat temp minus the condenser outlet, and superheated and subcooled refrigerants do not follow a pressure temperature relationship. We know that modern refrigerants must be safe and detectable and that the pressure enthalpy chart provides a graphical representation of the refrigeration system.